Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part two of parenchymal liver disease. We left off last time mentioning the topic of regenerating nodules, and there are many ways of describing regenerating nodules. From a clinical perspective, the problem to me is they simulate metastasis or in a cirrhotic liver hepatoma. You see multiple vascular lesions here. Could this be regenerating nodules? In fact, that's what it is. But could this be metastatic neuroendocrine tumor? Could this be multifocal hepatoma? Now, in this case, the patient has Bud Chiari syndrome. You see on the venous phase the lack of the hepatic veins, the patchy enhancement. And you also see the nodules again present, which wash out a bit. It is a challenging diagnosis. Now, one thing I've found is with regenerating nodules, most common in Bud Chiari syndrome, they get larger from arterial to venous phase, as you can see here. And that's a really good thing. METs or primary tumors stay the same or get smaller regenerating nodules often get larger. So there is, a, a, that can be helpful, but I still will say it's a challenging process and we'll talk about it some more. This article by Chung, more careful attention should be paid to large nodules in patients with micronodule cirrhosis because of the potential risk of malignancy while small nodules should be followed. And so we will come back to the regenerating nodules when I speak about Bud Chiari but it is a challenge in terms of imaging. Sometimes MR can be helpful, sometimes you really need biopsy. Now, what other things can we look at? Passive hepatic congestion. Typically due to cardiac disease, it's usually poor right-sided function, and we can be due to constrictive pericarditis, tricuspid insufficiency, but usually right heart failure. Cardiac cirrhosis may be irreversible even if cardiac function is improved. What do we typically see? We see reflux of contrast into the IVC and hepatic veins. It's typically you look and then you look at the chest and you see the patient has a big heart. It's most common in old patients. People have made the point that occasionally in younger patients you can see reflux in the hepatic veins, but that's pretty rare. We see modeled enhancement of the liver due to hepatic congestion. Liver is commonly enlarged. You may see ascites and periportal edema. You often commonly see pleural effusions because the patient has cardiac failure. Good example, look at the reflux into the IVC and hepatic veins, which are huge. Beautiful, beautiful example of that. And you can see here it is again from the routine coronal to the MIP. Large hepatic veins, reflux. This patient has passive congestion. The heart uh, is large, though not that large. And here it is with, with a uh, volume rendering. Very, very impressive. Here's a view from above. Again, typical con passive hepatic congestion. Now, as long as we're talking about different processes that impact on the vessels and the veins, let's talk about bug chiari. It's an uncommon condition characterized by obstruction of the hepatic venous outflow tract. It can vary in presentation from asymptomatic conditions to fulminant liver failure. It's a classic example of post-sinusoidal portal hypertension. Now, some of the facts. Hepatic venous outflow obstruction can be segmental or global. As we mentioned, it can be acute or chronic in nature and it's more common to get regenerating nodules in Bud Chiari than in any other condition. We talk about primary versus secondary. Primary membranous obstruction of the hepatic venous outflow tract, often by a web. The secondary is more common, thrombosis due to causes ranging from chemotherapy or radiation therapy to hypercoagulability states to different tumors. We talk about hypercoagulability states that are inherited. They all can do it from factor V to protein C deficiency to acquired hypercoagulability states. Think about myeloproliferative disorders, polycythemia varia as two good examples. We also talk about different processes. And again, you can see in that acquired category, that's typically what we think about. We have seen it also in patients with ulcerative colitis as a consequence of pregnancy and as a consequence of oral contraceptives. If we go by the numbers, only about 5% have that fulminant presentation, up to 20% are asymptomatic, and about 60% are subacute or chronic. You can classify Bug Chiari type 1 limited to the IVC, type 2 limited to the hepatic veins, and the typical type 3 of hepatic vein and IVC involvement. So what's the CT appearance? Patchy enhancement, especially in the arterial phase, with increased enhancement of the central portion of the liver, 
decreased enhancement peripherally, and then you get a flip-flop. You can see an enlarged caudate lobe, compressed and narrowed IVC, the absence of hepatic veins on venous phase imaging, ascites, and again, the presence of regenerating nodules. In the acute phase, the early enhancement of the caudate lobe and central portion of the liver around the IVC is classic, and decreased enhancement around the periphery of the liver. There is then delayed enhancement of the periphery of the liver, while the central portion is of low attenuation, and that's this flip-flop appearance that's, in a sense, classic for Bucchiari. And then again, the hypodense hepatic veins in IVC are seen. In the chronic phase, we see non-visualization of the IVC and hepatic veins, and again, regenerating nodules. In terms of management, it really depends on when you pick things up. Medical management, especially anticoagulant therapy, is ideal. Surgical management may result if the patient develops liver failure with a liver transplant. And endovascular therapies, including angioplasty, stent placement, and catheter-directed thrombolysis are all things that have been used. So let's look at some examples. Classic prominent enhancement of the caudate lobe, patchy enhancement of the rest of the liver. As you go a little bit later, you can see the increased enhancement around the periphery of the liver as well. That differential enhancement peripheral to central, the puddling, the lack of venous opacification as I go through the images. Or in this case, very much again, central increased enhancement, ascites, decreased attenuation where the vein should be, or in this example, prominent left lobe, patchy enhancement, you're not seeing the veins, you are seeing multiple small nodules which are regenerating nodules. The disease looks different in this case in the right and the left lobe, very nicely shown. And when you look at additional images in this patient, the regenerating nodules, the patchy decreased enhancement, no intrahepatic duct dilatation, here it is again on the coronal view. So you really get a feel. Now, you say at first, well, this maybe looks like fatty infiltration of the liver. And again, the density is good for fatty infiltration. The issue tends to be you see the regenerating nodules. You also see the lack of hepatic veins. You also see stretching of the hepatic artery. There's mass effect. And again, I could see why someone might consider the thought of metastasis or multifocal hepatoma. Again, the lack of hepatic veins will be very, very helpful. Now, I've seen some interesting cases. This is a patient with sarcoidosis, classic adenopathy in the hilar and subcarinal regions. And then when you scan the abdomen, you see stretching of the hepatic artery branching within the liver. And then you see the patchy enhancement, the differential enhancement between the central portion of the liver and the periphery, the very prominent vessels. There's a lesion in the spleen that was due to sarcoidosis. But look at the patchy enhancement of the liver, particularly as you go to the periphery, and particularly as you get to the dome. You see prominent vessels, but you don't see the hepatic veins. You see the IVC is narrowed. You see the fluid by the IVC, the patchy enhancement. And it's interesting, if you do a, a view from above, you see the collaterals along the surface of the dome of the liver on the MIP imaging, and you again appreciate on the cinematic rendering the extensive changes in texture, particularly by the caudate lobe. So it's interesting, sarcoid is one of the causes of Bucchiari syndrome, and just a beautiful example here. Now, in Bucchiari, we mentioned acute and chronic. and chronic Bucchiari, failure to visualize the IVC or hepatic veins, intrahepatic collateral veins are not uncommon, this heterogeneous liver enhancement, regenerating nodules, and marked caudate hypertrophy. So here's an example. The patient has a tips in place, regenerating nodules. And you can see regenerating nodules can be very impressive. In this case, look at these lesions. It looks like vascular mets or it looks like multifocal hepatoma. It's kind of like a ring-like lesion, high density with the periphery being lower attenuation. Here it is again. The patient has a a uh, stent in place from the IVC to the portal vein, uh, which is a TIPS catheter. In patients with regenerating nodules like this, they can become uh, almost impossible to see on late phase or on the patient's non-contrast scans.
And also, if you had a PET scan, this patient, in fact, had a PET CT, and you can see that the lesions are not vascular, and if it was hepatoma, you would expect to see increased avidity on the PET. Now, not every hepatoma or MET is avid on PET, but regenerating nodules typically are not. Now, that kind of is a really good look at some of the parenchymal liver disease. In bug Chiari, we are seeing a few more cases, but it's important to recognize it and when the case comes along, not to confuse it with a different process, including malignancy. Now, what other things we talk about in parenchymal liver disease? So one of the things worthwhile talking about is infection. And we do see more commonly abscesses now. Now, the typical thing about abscesses is clinical history is good. The patient's febrile. The patient was recently post-op. The patient had foreign travel. Um, Abscesses can be pyogenic, fungal, or amoebic in nature. Up to 90% of abscesses are pyogenic, with E. coli being the most common, often a sequel of diverticulitis or appendicitis. Clinical history usually helps with the diagnosis because it's important to remember, and I'll show you examples, that abscesses can simulate malignant tumors, and malignant tumors can simulate abscesses, so it can be somewhat tricky. Now, in this case, you can say there's a cystic lesion, and how do I not think it's a cyst. Well, it's irregular in borders and you see extensive perfusion changes. Cystic lesions are not uncommonly abscesses. The walls are irregular, so it's not a simple cyst. Occasionally, simple cysts, when they're large enough, can compress and you get perfusion changes, but most of the time they do not. But surely you do not get this mottled perfusion change that you see here. That can be seen with metastasis, but more commonly seen with abscesses. This was E. coli. As we mentioned, pyogenic abscesses are the most common source of abscesses, more common right lobe of the liver. We can see air fluid levels, but well under 25%, probably more like 15%. So if you wait to see air fluid levels, you're going to miss about 80% or so of liver abscesses. There is a thing called a cluster sign, which you can see with pyogenic abscesses, and I'll show you an example in a moment. And again, abscesses can be single or multiple. I mentioned there are multiple categories of abscesses, and I mentioned that at times it can be tricky. This is a good example. This patient was a homeless person, all sorts of things, weight loss, all sorts of different symptoms, no medical care. I thought this was a tumor. This was biopsy. It was an abscess. Okay, should I have said an abscess? I guess I could have, could have considered an abscess, but it wasn't a great history for that. And this is large. When I see large, I think about tumor, primary versus metastatic. But abscesses can be in that ballpark, so it's important to think about that. Pyogenic abscesses caused by hematogenous spread from the GI tract, things like ascending cholangitis, diverticulitis, appendicitis. E. coli is the most common agent. And the clinical history, fever, right-sided abdominal pain, and weight loss, and often elevated liver function studies. With pyogenic abscesses, they can be single or multiple. They can involve more commonly the right lobe, but can involve both lobes of the liver. Occasionally, you see rim enhancement, and as I mentioned, air within an abscess occurs, but probably no more than 15 to 20 percent of the time. Now, at times, you can be confused. This is a low-density lesion, and the patient was febrile. So this is a patient who was in their 20s. I thought this was going to be an abscess, and maybe it was a pyogenic abscess, but it was kind of weird-looking. And so this was eventually uh, uh, drained and uh, cultured. And this was very unusual. It was hydata disease. Now, hydata disease is endemic to certain parts of the world. When we see it, it typically is a cystic lesion with septations, and 70% have rim-like calcifications. This is a person who was local, had done some travel to South America for a few weeks, and they had this lesion now present. But again, it's a very atypical appearance. In hydata disease, uh, humans acquire disease from eating contaminated meat. Eosinophilia is common. Now, when we talk about hydata abscesses, hydata disease, it's often common to see not just liver involvement, but other organs from spleen to retroperitoneum to heart. So that can be helpful, but not necessarily the case. Now, what about this case? Patient's young, it's febrile, this is an abscess. And you can see it's low density and there are cystic components. And when I look at the coronal view, you see kind of the low density rim around it, a very common appearance for abscesses. 
when you go from arterial to venous phase, you now see the cystic components kind of looks like a clover leaf or cluster. This is a very common appearance for abscesses, and particularly amoebic abscesses. Amoebic abscesses, just a few points, is the most common extraintestinal manifestation of amoebiasis, more common in India, Far East, Africa, and South America. So patients who migrants, something to think about. Patients are usually very sick with a high fever, and the travel history is going to be critical. Again, for amoebic abscesses, enhancing rim of a cystic lesion, a zone of edema, and the lesions are usually solitary but may be multiple. So you can see there is a spectrum with abscesses, and the spectrum, again, is shown in this example. Now, this is somewhat of an easier case because this patient had AML, was immunosuppressed, and now was febrile, and you picked up liver lesions as well as splenic lesions. Patients who are immunosuppressed, candidiasis is very common, okay? Aspergillosis is probably number two. Typically, multiple lesions, not just in the liver, but also liver and spleen, and often also in the kidney. Again, typically, you have old scans, so it's a new finding. And yes, you can consider, could the patient have tumor? but the patient is febrile, and these are typically going to be abscesses, not a difficult diagnosis. Now, when you mention abscesses, I also like to throw in infarcts. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish the two. Other times it's easy. Infarcts, wedge-shaped, peripheral, you can see very nicely here. You can see very nicely on these examples as well. Infarcts can be solitary or can be multiple, as in this example. But again, it looks like it goes from the edge of a vessel, sharply demarcated, almost looks like a slice of pizza. Now, obviously, a case like this with a liver transplant and the hepatic artery is occluded, you end up with a large infarct, which is more central in this case, and that's not very difficult. If you're running a fever and you're post-op liver transplant, you look at the hepatic artery and it's occluded, you have an hepatic infarct. But you can see how large these can be but again, the small peripheral ones are the challenging ones. can look like focal fatty infiltration of the liver, occasionally can simulate tumor. And here's just another example. One of the things we can do well with CT, also with Doppler, is look at the patient's hepatic artery. You see hepatic artery occlusion in a patient post-liver transplant, nicely shown there. It's not surprising that you're going to end up with hepatic infarcts. So again, look at the vascular map. It's something we can do very well. I mentioned with abscesses or infarcts, it's uncommon to see air. This is a patient with a liver infarct and abscess following liver transplant with occluded hepatic artery. Again, it's rare to see such air within a collection, but it does occur. Now, what else? One of the challenges, what can simulate a malignant tumor? And there are a number of things, but let's stop here and let's do part three, picking up some of these uh, pitfalls. And I'll see you back in five to seven minutes. Be right back. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctsus.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.